Oarsmen and sword maidens, whitewash your golden altars, cut off your nose to spite your face, and may the Bifrost bring you a bucket of blessings. Ah, it's time to talk tall to me. You call that an oar? This is an oar! I don't have anything else. Welcome back. I am Omen Thomas Said. And I am Nick McGill. Together we are Feckless Moans. And this is Talk Tall to Me. An epic voyage of exploration through the nine worlds of Prog Rock, in which Nurte Nick and Omen Odinson will fight as bravely as can be expected to defend each and every track that Born of Giants rock band Jethro Tull has ever produced. We will cower in fear at the Peter John Vatisse Valkyries, carefully check the audience's pockets for mistletoe before letting them approach Martin Baldur Bar, and keep a weather eye open for the sales of David Coldwater Pirate Peg. And if we achieve glory in this battle, we may receive the blessing of the All-Father Anderson, which is to be not impaled by his broad flute. He's got one eye... And one leg. And one flute. That's right. And two ravens. That's right. I do too. Who are actually cats. <laughs> he's, got, he's got way more than two cats. <laughs> I think it's safe to say. <laughs> two special ones that sit on his shoulder. <laughs> Nick, welcome back to the podcast. It's lovely to be here. It's lovely to see all of our fans in our mind's eye. It's, it is getting warm. I have started breaking out the fans, yes. <laughs> and before we jump into the day's chat, the talking of the tall, as it were, we have a little fact for you about the album that we're on. So just a teeny tiny little snippet about the song that we discussed two weeks ago, Flying Colors. This is a live performance from 1982 so they were touring for broadsword sure. at the time it was the ship tour this is for, it was the ship tour yeah and we will talk about that in the middle of the show yes but uh this is from a 1982 concert in paris and this is a little blurb about flying colors i will play with you now vaguely in the rock and roll genre one of those rare boy-girl songs that I tend seldom to write. Tricky sort of thing, you see. Tricky subject. <laughs> so that confirms that it's a boy-girl song, that yeah. it's just a terrible relationship song. I was listening to that song the other day, and I think when I was driving around in Texas and I was just just really, like, feeling the vibe of that song and remembering our conversation about it and thinking how, you know... How just the intricacies of like, oh, yeah, this person does this and then this person responds with this and then this person does yeah. this. And suddenly you're like, you're you're using full firepower and war crimes are being committed. <laughs> and no one's held responsible. It's really it's really amazing how effective that song is. Oh, yes. In, in terms of really like getting the idea across and making it so so darn potent. It's really, yeah, it's a good, that's, I, I have a new respect for that song. However, that is not the song of today. Today, Nick, we are talking about the first song on the B side of Correct. this album. Yes. Entitled Broadsword. Broadsword it is. The titular track off the Broadsword side. Let's, let's paint our chests and braid our hair and run into battle. <laughs> I thought that was going in a very different direction. Yeah. Yes, let's have a listen. Let's paint our hair, braid our braid chests. Our chests. <laughs> It is. There's broadsword. That's my broadsword. So 
I have a question for you. I I accept and embrace said question. You are someone who often visualizes when listening to music, no? I yes. Yeah, particularly tall, yeah, but yes. Does this song give you a strong set of visuals? Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a sweeping it's a it's a sweeping epic rock music video in some sort of animation, kind of a rough style. It's kind of like the the Aqualung character but broad-chested and ready for battle, standing on a cliff looking over the the lock ready to right, go. Right. It's the it's the imagery that I think Ian mentioned early early on. Uh, a quote from Ian that we discussed early, early on. At the time, I was living some of the year on the Isle of Skye in the wilds off the west coast of Scotland facing the sea. In the times gone by, the Viking longships came up the sea locks of Scotland to pillage and plunder and generally have their wicked way with the locals. That's that's what I see. Yeah. Whether it's the 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 imagery of the viking coming in and and doing the pillaging or the scots defending them yeah. themselves you know but it's 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 just this epic epic sound and feel and that's that's what i get it it really it, plays to my high fantasy predilection particularly when i was a little kid i love that you said that you used the word fantasy because i think that that is something that that's something i've been thinking about with this song that you know oftentimes ian's writing takes the form of a critique or an anecdote or a or a story but this really to me is just him on the sea cliff living his viking defense <laughs> fantasy like yeah. just fully giving you 800 AD realness yeah i mean there's there is a there's a historical basis for it you know it's there not is. completely whole cloth but it's certainly more fantastical than Aqualung, you know. It's fantastical in a different way. I think that you said it. This is high fantasy, whereas sure. Aqualung is sort of fantasy for like an everyday fantasy. Well, that's fiction. That's fiction versus fantasy. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that that Aqualung is a is a manufactured character to to tell the moral of a story in some way to get a, a, to get an allegory across. This is just look at that. Look at that warrior on the cliffs. Right, right, Ready right. to defend his homeland. Yes, exactly. And there's and as you said, there's a historical basis. So I guess we could call it historical fantasy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's I mean, there's there's plenty of that nowadays. His tank is he? he? He might be. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Nick, should we talk about the music? Yeah, let's talk musically about Broadsword. So this is one of the more musically, this is one of the more straightforward Jethro Tull songs that we have on this album, at least. Yeah, it's it's pretty, it's, it's certainly not proggy. Even I can tell that. It's not particularly proggy. It's in 4-4 time the whole way through. Yeah. Which is underscored by that, the drum beat. Dum, 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 yes, dum, the war drums. Dum, yep. Oh, yes, totally. You know, we, we were joking about oars. The Viking ships had both sailing and rowing capacity. Mm -hmm. And the there was often on those ships when whenever... Whenever you're using, whenever you're rowing, whenever your conveyance is rowing and there is more than one person involved, it's good to have some kind of a rhythm. Yeah. You, you got to keep time so everybody knows when to pull, when to, to rest. Otherwise, when, you just- When to turn, when to break. You're just going in circles. You're probably literally going in circles. Oh, absolutely. So there would be, you know, a, a drummer on those ships. Mm-hmm. In more modern times, uh, anyone familiar with the sport of crew might be familiar mm -hmm. with the coxswain. Saying stroke, 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 right? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been familiar with some coxswains yeah, in my time. There it is. Saying stroke, stroke, stroke. Yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> and the that sense of a rhythm continuing through the song is also 
underscored by the bass. The bass and the drum come kind of are good partners a lot in this song. I have I definitely caught that. They are they they don't shine, but but you can hear them clearly. I feel like they've gotten kind of lost the last couple of songs, but boy, they are they're really solid in this one. They provide a a sense of darkness. They provide a, a dark feeling. Yes. Potentially on the horizon. Potentially on the horizon, but maybe getting closer. It's fairly steady. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing that's interesting about the construction of this song is that it doesn't really have a chorus. No, it's it's kind of it's kind of a proto song even. It just kind of kind of it just kind of happens. It kind of all unfolds. Yeah, there's three verses. The refrain, the recurring phrase, bring me my broadsword is as close we get to a sense of repetition. There's some themes that are yeah. re- that are repeated here and there, but it's pretty much just, you know, three verses uh, and, a, and a solo breakdown, and that's it. Yeah. All that being said, it's still four and a half minutes long. And I think that there's something about that, that slowness with that steady beat and the fact that it's not mm. a short song that really allows the listener to get into that fantasy. I mean, yeah. when I listen to this song, I literally get goosebumps imagining the setting imagining mm. the the conflict of cultural values <laughs> yeah the the history of it you know the it really it really does something for me and i think that it's that it's that slow steady kind of lurking quality to it that does that for me yeah yeah i i certainly agree that it's effective but it, it doesn't it doesn't really spark anything for me it's it's if the sound is going to be so plotting, those lyrics better really shine and pop. And they don't. They're kind of like afterthought, it feels like almost. Interesting. So so this song does not do much for me. This may be controversial. I apologize to anyone. Sorry, not sorry. I, it, it, this, it may be, I, it just doesn't do it for me. Yeah. I think what's interesting is you know, and one of the things that I've learned through the course of doing this podcast with you is that you and I have different things which kind of do it for us in terms yeah. of toll. Absolutely, yes. And I think that's instructive because, you know, probably for every single person, there's like songs that do it for them and songs that don't do it for them. And and there's, you know, everyone's makeup of those songs is probably pretty, pretty individual to them. It's like a fingerprint. Yeah, we've we've certainly there there have been some runs, particularly early on, where pretty much everyone in the Discord is like, "Oh, this album, this song, great, wonderful." I think right. we're we're really starting to get into that point, particularly in this album, where where we're we're starting to break off, where we're starting to see people who are like, "Eh, I could take it or leave it," where people's tastes become more specific. Yes, well, and part of that is because I think you know we're getting into a period where the sound is changing. Of course, the sound has changed every album up to now, but now it's really changing and incorporating new technologies. And I think some people respond to some of those sounds better than others. New technologies and the the tenure of musicians. Yeah, it's it, totally. it changes over a lot more quickly. Yeah. So something about this song does it for me. I love okay. the fantasy of it. It it really allows me to go there. And I think that the slowness and steadiness of the beat contributes to that for me. Okay. I do want to point out a couple of really interesting things musically within the song. Even though the structure is so s- the same throughout, yeah, there are all these little rhythmic and instrumental flourishes or or adjustments that happen that really help to illustrate the the lyrics. So, for instance, in that first verse, I see a dark sail on the horizon set under a black cloud that hides the sun. Right after hides the sun, we have a drum fill and a synth sweep that kind mm. of illustrate that point. Set under a black cloud that hides the sun. You know, you almost feel the the cloud passing in front of the sun and you get that sense. It's really a, a great sonic image. Sure, sure. When Ian sings, bring me my cross of gold, there is a synth created heavenly chorus that comes in really softly bring me my cross of gold as a talisman as soon as we hear the word roundhouse which we'll talk a little bit about later mm-hmm. 
we hear Martin for the first time. Oh, his stings? Yeah, it's light. It's sort of just the just the a little breath of the electric. We hear yeah, the electric okay. guitar for the first time. Okay. Get up to the so even with the simplicity of it, there is some skillfulness specifically around developing the imagery and developing the feelings of some of these very specific contexts. Mm -hmm. Or sorry, uh, developing some of these very specific concepts in this song. And that's what I like about this song is that it sets up all of these different kind of points of value within this fantasy world. Okay. I will listen to it with renewed ears. I will try to listen for that. It, it, it just, it, none of that ever really jumped out at me in the past. I think it's a bit subtle. Uh, similarly, when we have Take Women and Children, we have that bum, 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 bum. Yes. The synth yeah, yeah, yeah. horns. Take women and children. Yes, I've definitely, definitely caught those. Those are, those are always so silly. I think maybe one of the reasons that this kind of, doesn't turn me off it just doesn't excite me is that this is a while every song up until this point has been pretty gosh darn 80s sounding this one is is so 80s sounding with all the synth but it, it i feel like it's not contributing anything to it interesting you feel like you would as happily listen to a completely non synth version of this yeah Give me put make D strings in this. You want a full orchestral version of Broadsword? Yes, I do. I wonder if that exists. I know they did some orchestration stuff. Even D on her own did some or orchestration of of tall stuff. I don't know if that one exists. I'll have to look that up. We'll talk a little bit more about this in the lyrics section in the second half of the show. But you know, both you and I went through various forms of acting training. And one of the things that you and I learned very early on is when you're working with text in order to help the character come to life and make the text not sound just like words, you really need to have an opinion on every single thing that you say. You know, every time you bring up a place or a, an object or a word or a person, you should feel the actor's or the character's opinion on that thing. Yeah, you as the character should. Right. Yeah. Yep. It's not like, I'm going to Macy's on Tuesday. It's I'm going to Macy's on Tuesday. Yeah. And with those little instrumental variations, I feel like we hear a lot of the opinion coming through on each of these concepts. That's the thing that kind of hmm. that I like about it. Okay. I like that. I like that. To go back to super crazy synth, that breakdown, that kind of oh yeah, bridge, I guess, with Martin and PJV, kind of duetting back and forth, dueling stings. Uh -huh. It's it's so it's so 80s. It's very 80s. Right down <laughs> to that drum fill that that brings yes. Martin into his big solo. Dun, 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 yeah. Dun, dun, dun. yeah. Wow. I love it. Martin is very shreddy on this. Super shreddy. He does a lot of stuff that's that's really like, makes me think of Jack Black for some reason. You know, I think that Jack mm. Black was very inspired by a lot of this, you know, this 80s kind of yeah. sound. And also the fantasy of it. You know, that's something that, that oh, um, the, yeah. Tenacious D was always very good at. Certainly a bit harder than Martin's stuff, more like Dio and Black Sabbath. But but yeah, I, I see it. I get it. Yeah. But with this, but with this sound that Martin's doing here, it kind of edges in a little bit to that that more like screaming guitar feel. Yeah, I think it's I think it's some of the closest that we get to really just raging rock. And it's so lovely. It's great. It's it's a good it's a unique sound and he does it well. I'll give you that. Anything else to say musically about this song, Nick? No, I don't I don't think so. I don't think so. Just to point out the ending, it it sort of returns from whence it came in a way. Mm -hmm. Which is yeah. a good ear image, I think, with the story, because it's like, you know, is the has the attack been repelled? Is the ship fading into the distance mm -hmm. and the the village which was being defended is nothing but ashes? Did the ship never stop and it just is sailing on and this was all like the preparation 
that needs to happen every single time you see any ship. Yeah. It's kind of fun. I do like that. I like that that idea. Oh, and and I do have one more thing. Just the um, just the backing vocals only on the broadsword. Yeah, it's great. It's very full. It's, it's very yeah. It's fun. It's fun. Bring me my broadsword. They really forged those harmonies in the in the hot fire of of. Badassness. <laughs> yeah, I, I had nothing for you there. You were all on your own. <laughs> all right, then let's say I think it's safe to say we're about halfway there. You're only halfway there. Nick, hello, and welcome to the middle part of the show where we have our OSHA required break. Here we have, I've got two things for you today, Omen, for, for our sweet listeners. Take them out of your lunchbox. Uh, sit down on that, that steel girder. Hundreds of feet above the city <laughs> and uh, and enjoy the egg salad that your wife baked you. Yeah. Do you want broadsword notes or an email first? Oh, broadsword notes, please. Broadsword notes it is. So we mentioned e- earlier, we talked about the tour. We played that clip from the 1982 tour. This was the broadsword tour. We sure did. So this, as you said, this was the tour that had the mock longship right. in it. And this was the last of the the big pageantry Tours. Everything else was pared down after that. Not only the big long ship, but also the the life sized human shaped puppet that rode around on Ian's back. Ian uh, ran around with an eight foot long sword. Oh, did he really? Yep. Oh, that's good. During watching me watching you, roadies in white coats came out on stage. Eventually, followed by a guy in a giant bunny suit. Oh yes. <laughs> This is from excerpts from one of the the Tull magazines here. The tour for Broadsword was the last of the bands to be exceedingly theatrical. Mm. It included the entire stage being decorated to look like a pirate ship, which Ian Anderson, as he said in the liner notes for the remastered CD, thought was, quote, very silly. (laughs) In 82, a review of the concert, Chris Welch reported, quote, Squire Anderson waved a huge broadsword dangerously near Martin's nether extremities during songs from their latest album, The Broadsword and the Beast, and punted huge exploding balloons out into the audience. But it was the roar of the band as they got into their heaviest moments that ultimately captivated an audience who seemed evenly mixed between 14-year-old novice tall freaks and silver-haired rock business veterans. Wow. Tull have a vast library of music to perform. They could have played on for another two hours and the audience would have been with them cheering all the way. Pretty good review, really. Not bad. What more do you want? Dangerous swords, exploding balloons, the roar of the crowd. It it sounds sounds like they they got the job done. I wonder if there was like an, an executive decision. After this, to be like, I'm just too old for this. I'm just too I think tired. We'll find out as we get into the next album. But I, I think it's fascinating that the Tull audience is largely the same now as it is then. It's you know younger people who are just discovering Tull and the veterans. It's just that the the 14 year old novice Tull freaks from this tour are now the silver haired rock exactly. business veterans. <laughs> exactly, they all have mortgages. <laughs> That's it for Broadsword Notes. Shall we jump quickly into a little email poo here? Let's jump into it. Your emails, sir. Also akin to rock tours, I think this works. This is from returning writer inner Greg K. Greggy K writes in with the subject... Meeting Your Heroes. Oh. He says, In 1989, during the Rock Island tour, Ian Anderson popped into the rock radio station along with It Bites lead singer Francis Dunnery for a half-hour interview in promotion of the show they were performing that evening. As the station was only a couple of miles down the road from my workplace, I downed tools and dashed out as soon as I heard them come on air. I was such a fanboy, I couldn't pass on a chance to actually meet the great man. I walked into the station offices like I owned the place and waited. A few minutes later, after the interview concluded, Ian and Francis came walking out and boom, 
my chance had arrived. I walked up to Ian and asked if he wouldn't sign my 20 years of Jethro Tull booklet that came with the box set. He was very gracious and took the time to sign and thanked me for coming. Hmm. Ian was a bit shorter than I imagined, standing an inch or two below my 5'10 in height. He was dressed in what could only be described as a country squire outfit with riding pants with those pads or patches inside the thighs and knees and a flat cap. Yes. He was smoking an enormous and absolutely foul-smelling hand-rolled cigarette. The only question I had time to ask was, quote, Being from America, I have no idea what a static humming panel beater is. Can you tell me? He gave a short chortle and said, Just a pissed off bloke, you know. The two men then proceeded to leave, and I returned to my work with a story to tell. Wow. Yeah. That's a great story. He's also met them a couple of more times. In 91, he met them at the Richmond airport to meet them off the, as they came off the plane. Had a nice chat with Dave Pegg and Martin Alcock, who was playing keyboards at the time. He got a chat with Don Perry and Martin Barr. He had a chat with Don Perry, Martin Barr, and Peggy, and they all signed his books. He showed a picture of his new son, who was born only a few weeks before, telling them that he was named Ian, and Martin chimed in and asked, why didn't you name him Jethro? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you for that, Martin. A little, a little jealousy not, not being named Martin, maybe. I think Martin's a fantastic name. It's a great name. And, uh, and then he also met them in 2002 in Western New York, the Chautauqua Institute where he met Andy Giddings and Jonathan Noyce. So he's he's run the gamut of of meeting these guys. And this is an instance where it seems like it, it did not end poorly, like some uh, some instances of meeting your heroes do. Exactly. We had, we had that discussion a while ago, yeah. So it's not so much don't meet your heroes, but meet your heroes, but don't put all your eggs in one basket. Have better heroes, I think. Have better, the... <laughs> make sure your heroes are Ian Anderson and yeah. the rest of the band of Jethro Tull, you'll be fine. Perfect. Moral of the story. Lesson learned. Nick, anything else for our act break here? That's it. Let's flip this album over and let's get into the second part. We're going to dim the lights, you know, Ooh. in one second intervals every 10 seconds. Yep. Make sure you finish going to the bathroom, grab your drink, grab your pretzels. Open your crinkly candies now. Oh, yeah. O open please. them now. There's cough drops yeah. right as you come in. Yep. Get settled in for the second uh, for the second half. And away we go. Nick, welcome back to the regular portion of our show, and welcome back to our listeners. I am very excited to talk about the lyrics to the song Broadsword. Here it is. Two, really two and a half stanzas here for a four and a half minute song. Yeah, two and then some recycled bits. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So overall... Are we getting any deeper than muscled guy in kilt looking over the, the, the lock here? Well, I think that we can pull back and look at what is the historical importance of that image or that moment that, that Ian was using as his inspiration. Sure. In terms of the history of, of Western Europe and the Viking raids that were from the late 700s common era to the early to mid 1100s or 1200s had a massive effect on the culture in, in Europe. And actually a lot of the phrases that we, a lot of the words and phrases that we use, we've talked a little bit about this before, come from n the Norse languages because the, the sure. cultural impact was so great that just tons of words ended up getting adopted. But the, or rather, and it really shocked the European culture at that time. I mean, their Christianity had now flourished in Europe and the British Isles, and there were all these monasteries, which, you know, and other, and other religious institutions that had been amassing wealth for now a couple mm, of hundred years. Sure. And the Vikings realized, oh, wow, there are all these coastal monasteries that have tons of gold and jewels, and no one is defending them. Yeah, it's just a bunch of fat priests, yeah. So there's lots of stories of both archaeologists randomly finding a, a literal pot of all of the gold in a village buried under a stone. Mm. Because, you know, if you knew the Vikings were coming, one of the things you did, you would want to do is hide all your valuables so they couldn't steal them. Yeah. But sometimes all the valuables would be hidden and then 
everyone in the village would be killed and no one would remember where it was buried. <laughs> yeah, and everyone who knows where it is is no longer alive. Right. Yeah. There were instances of people literally taking white paint and painting over the the golden crucifix so it would look like a wooden crucifix. Oh, wow, sure. And the phrase, cut off your nose to spite your face, goes back to an incident where it there was a an abbey um, where the nuns live. What do you call that? A, nun- a nunnery. A nunnery. An, an abbey. Because there's an abbess. Oh, yeah, it's an abbey. Yeah. And the abbess got word that there was a Viking raid coming and the Vikings were famous or the stories at least were very convincing about them sure. pillaging, but also raping all the women that they found. And so the abbess took a dull knife and cut her own nose off so that the raiders would be so horrified that they would leave them alone. And mm. immediately, because they were all, you know, caught up in this religious fervor, all the other nuns and sisters took out knives and whacked off their own noses, leaving themselves horribly disfigured. And the Vikings arrived and went, oh, God, what what have we walked into? And they left. We'll just do the pillaging part here. Yeah. We won't bother with the, uh, yeah. Exactly. And so it, it worked, but, you know, they all had no noses. But that's the origin of that phrase. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Is that apocryphal or is that like, do we do we know that that's like legitimate? I think it's apocryphal. Speaking of Christianity, that really kind of brings me to to solidify. I know I said in the beginning, it was like this could be the Viking coming in. You know, this could be the image of of the, the story of the Viking making this this trek in preparing for battle or it could be the opposite side the 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 defenders i do think it's the defenders now that that we're talking about christianity because of the line bring me my cross of gold as a talisman bring me my cross of gold as a talisman yes and that was also a big cultural conflict between the the Viking raiding parties and those whom they were raiding, Christianity was kind of the, the standard theological system in in Europe and England, and the Vikings were still pagan, still uh, polytheistic. Yeah. So a little, little tension there. A little tension that, you know, resulted in a lot of bloodshed and cultural exchange. Yeah. Okay, so in 867, a Viking raiding party landed in Scotland, and when news of this reached Ebba, now Saint Ebba, Mm. She herself and then all of her sisters cut off their noses and their upper lips. Oh, got to get the upper lip just to really, really make it as as horrifying as possible. And so the Viking raiders, when they arrived, they were so disgusted that rather than pillage and disflower the nuns, they simply locked them all in the church and burned it to the ground. Win-win scenario for everybody. But you got to remain pure. Yes, for God, which is which was important. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it was. And actually, that kind of comes to this to the heart of this song. It's like, I think the Vikings were really viewed with this sense of fear that that there was almost no good standing up to them because they were so Mm. ferocious Mm. and and vicious and so well equipped and so so battle hungry. Right. And so, you know, from the point of view of the singer, maybe there is only one broadsword in the entire village. He's like, well, bring me the one legit weapon that we have and everyone else get your pitchforks and clubs and I will lead this defense. Sure. Right. Or, or everybody else get out of here and I'll, I'll try to keep them busy. Even, you know, like maybe he's sacrificing himself for the good of the village. I, yeah, totally. The line that really gets me is bring me my broadsword and clear understanding. Being battle ready, having that that clear, ready mind. Right, right. And really understanding <laughs> what you're getting into, what your role is rather than being taken over by fear. Yeah. And that kind of goes on with bless with a hard heart those who surround me. Bless with a hard heart those who surround me. Oh, so yeah, he is going in with his his fellow defenders whether they're warriors or villagers or what right but you know, and all he's asking for is like please just let them not run away <laughs> just i just i need a couple of guys on my back that's all i want that's all i'm asking for let's do this 
I, and I also love bless the women and children who firm our hands. Bless the women and children who firm our hands. I mean, it's very heteronormative and and unnecessarily gendered, but still there's something wonderful about the fact of, you know, about the, this idea, like I'm doing this for the people that I love, you know, let them, let my love for them firm my, my grip on this sword. So I don't drop it out of terrifying, yeah, you know, fear. Yeah. I think, I think it's heteronormative only in the sense that we're talking about the, the year 1800 or 800 rather, you know, I don't think it's Ian being terribly sexist here although he's he's had some comments that really don't fly well now but well you know and you know i think that he is a person born in a certain era yeah and also there is you know a lot of historical backing up to this kind of situation yeah exactly yeah maybe the vikings were gay that's they just wanted they they, it was just a bunch of bears on a boat omen that's all it was I've seen advertisements for that cruise. Yeah, it sounds fun, actually. Yeah, bears on a boat. Yep. <laughs> if you if you were to see that as a reality show, how confused would you be if it was just surviving being on a raft with a bear? Oh, that would be so disappointing. Yeah, that would be that would be gay baiting and bear baiting. Yeah, <laughs> gay bear baiting. <laughs> you would randomly, randomly choose which kind of boat you had. And which kind of bear you had. If you're lucky, you get a koala bear or a teddy bear. Pontoon and a panda. Pont- <laughs> Kayak and a koala. Barge and a black bear. <laughs> <laughs> a jib and a grizzly. Oh, that doesn't work. Oh, bummer. You know what? I am glad that at this point in our tall archaeology, we have such a firm handle on, on our awareness of the Isle of Skye. Yes. Yeah. Because I think it really brings this song into a much more specific light. Just in terms of the actual like geology, in terms of what it what the situation would be like. Isn't the roundhouse, isn't Dunring Gill a roundhouse? Yes. Okay, that's another thing that we should talk about. Yeah. The roundhouse is this ancient type of structure, which we have seen in popular culture in the... Star Wars sequel movies where Luke has gone feral and is living on those islands. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are all historical roundhouses. That was actually either a monastery or an abbey that probably got raided a bunch of times. It it looked fairly raidable. I was tempted to raid it myself. (laughs) The only reason you wouldn't want to raid it is because it has, it's up on the hill. Yeah. So you might, you'd have to do a lot of like, your quads would get in quite a lot of workout. I'm sure that the Vikings did not have to worry about burning quads. You think they did a lot of squats? I think they did enough things to be the equivalent of squats. Maybe some front lunges? Most likely a lot of front lunges. Yeah. Although you don't really want to raid an island where there is a Jedi warrior. That's true. I mean, we didn't see any raiders there while Luke was there, so. Bring me my lightsaber. (laughs) May the force be with you. It writes itself, doesn't it? (laughs) Take the women and pad (laughs) once. Oh, shit. It's Anakin. And, I mean, all silliness aside, I said, all silliness, I see what you've got behind your back. I'll put the rubber chicken away. That cultural image of one... Good man with with a sword standing up against insurmountable odds. We love it. We can't get enough of it. That is all the way through all of the Star Wars movies. It's in the Magnificent Seven. It's in every Western movie ever. Yeah, you know you've got you've got all the bad guys riding into town to raid, and then you've got the the one lone sheriff and his six shooters yeah. standing in the middle of the saloon street. <laughs> It's on Saloon Street. It's the, the corner of it's it's North Saloon Street. <laughs> oh, you got the wrong ad. I'll I'll wait for you here. We'll have our showdown. <laughs> Just a text. I'm here. Are you? <laughs> I'll be the one with the little liver. <laughs> Just a chicken emoji. Yeah. But you know that that image is is so throughout all of our hero myths and all of our popular culture. 
And I think Ian is really tapping into that cultural feeling and that fantasy with this song. I think so. I think that, I think that's a good way to put it. I think, I mean, we're talking Star Wars, we're talking Westerns, we can talk uh, any of the samurai movies as well. Totally. Japanese cinema. But I mean, all of that, we talked, I think, all the way back at Beastie, that ties back into Joseph Campbell. So that kind of really does a full circle on this album. Oh my gosh, this is our Hero's Journey album. Yeah. That's really interesting and exciting. Yeah, that, that makes me appreciate this song more. Definitely. Yeah. I think on that note... Do you have anything else to say about this song lyrics-wise? No. No, I do not. Do you? Just just one one little etymology of the word Viking. Please. The word Viking means to travel by sea. Huh. And those who do that were called Vikinger. Okay, sure. Which was a word that then became, you know, associated with the piracy element of it. Gotcha. Okay. But in English, we have shortened it. We've we've basically taken the verb and made it a noun, as we are wont to do. Very common, very very common, or or vice versa. Turning turning any part of speech into a different part of speech is 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 fairly common. Yeah, yeah. We talked about this a little bit before on an on, on another episode, but lots of words in English have come from Norse: uh-huh. club, gun, ransack. Scathe, slaughter. <laughs> Sensing a theme here. Yeah. <laughs> Bylaw. Interesting. Litmus. Loan. Sale. Skill. Stake. Thrift. Troll. Hmm. I'm trying to hear a, a sound. There's a lot of T. There's a lot of L. Well, the TH sound uh, was, was used a lot. Yeah. When you see like ye oldie. Yes. The Y was a TH sound. That's uh, right. that's that's the. I think that's Norse as well. I believe, right? Or is that just Old English? I think that was Old English, and then we we dropped it when the printing press arrived because we had to modify. You know, we had to just cut down on letters. There were too many letters. Just let's get rid of some of these letters. Yeah, muck, <laughs> rotten, below. Come on back next week. Glitter for elucidate etymology to me. Yeah. So many fun words. Nick, anything else to say at all about Broadsword? I refuse. What are we talking about next week? Next week, we're going from... From Viking longships to a sweet, sweet, sweet song. Probably euphemistic, but a sweet song. Pussy Willow. Oh, boy. (laughs) My basement is flooded in anticipation. Get out the sump pump, everybody. It's time for Pussy Willow. (laughs) Until next week, you can't buy a cross of gold on our T public, but you can buy all sorts of Talk Told to Me merch. You can find the link for that in our show notes. If you want some sweet memories to drive you on for the motherland, you might sign up for our Discord where you can find other individuals whose hearts have been hardened against the vicious attacks on Jethro Tull. You can do that through our Patreon page for $5 a month. And you can bless the women and children and even us with your firm hands by giving us five stars, five firm stars rating and review. That's a firm star you've got right there. Yeah. Until next week, I am the wind in your sail, Omen Thomas Said. I am the sweet memories that drive you for the motherland, Nick McGill. We are putting our backs to the north wind. Feckless Momes. And this is the black cloud that hides the sun. Talk tell to me. Oh. 
Sigrid? Sigrid, we've been at sea for weeks. Where are we going? Gunnhild, you know, I think... I just don't really know where we should raid today because, you know, there is the coast, but it seems like every time we go to shore, something happens. Do you remember when we went to that nunnery? Ugh! Don't remind me about the nunnery. I've had nightmares for weeks. I can't see a person with with prominent teeth now without just becoming violently ill. I wish we could have burned that church to the ground twice. They wouldn't let us. <laughs> they wouldn't give us the money to rebuild it just to burn it. <laughs> so no no more nunneries. We always the nunneries are too easy. It's too too easy and too much emotional labor to do it. Let's try. Have we done a, a monastery lately? You know we could do a monastery, but do you remember the last time we went to a monastery and everything was going so good? There was blood upon our saxes. There was blood upon our axes. There was blood upon our maxes. I, I remember that fondly. But then Max went into the garden and decided that he would rather become an agriculturalist. Ah, Pathetic. A, a shame to the entire tribe. To the entire village. Although his tomatoes are very, very tasty and we will stop by there afterwards. They are succulent. They are good. But shame on him. He will never go to Valhalla. Never. Never. But he will enjoy his earthly delights here. Yes, he will. Let's try... Okay, no monastery. We don't want to lose any more people. What about... Mm, just a village. Find the, the closest village. Okay, let's see. What have we got on the map? What have let's we got see. on the map? Let's we actually see. pull up a real map. Okay. <laughs> G- check, your, check the GPS. Check the sat map. We could go to Ulupul. We have not been there for a couple of years. Remember Ulupul? Is that the place where we made all of the men shit themselves? Oh, yes! And then just run with their pants and their ankles? Yes, yes, oh. that's how we got sustained on the sail there. That's, oh, that's... Remember. I do have fond memories of Ulupul. Uh, they were, they're probably... Probably have valuables back now, by now. It's okay, let's go to somebody. there, let's go to there. Let's go to Ulupul. <laughs> Oh, go, go! Oh no! Oh no! Gunnhild! Oh no! You see that sign? It says closed. I didn't know you could close a village. Ah, uh, we should have checked. We should have checked before. Oh, they need to update their site. Yes, yes. Oh, what about Toridon? Let's go to Toridon. Okay, okay. We have we. I think we usually skip Toridon, but uh, we let's... usually do because their mead takes like piss. But we don't need their mead. Let's take their women and we their, don't their gold. Don't have to do their mead. That's all. Their women also look like piss. Let's take their gold. We'll take their gold. Their gold. The only thing gold they have is piss. All right. Let's let's skip that one again. Okay, Staffen. Let's go to Staffen. Ah, Staffen. I think I I sired a child in Staffen once. You did sire a child in Staffen. Ooh, I... Yes, yes. When we whenever we sail past, I always look for the people who have the weird bump on their shoulder. I'm that's yours. I have not been paying child support. We should probably go around Staffen. We should go around. Okay, we go around Staffen. Yes. Uh, okay, let's go. What about we go down to to um, Karbusht? I, I can't pronounce that. Why are we going there? Okay, we don't go to Carbot. Oh, I know. We have not for a long time been to Donneringle. <gasps> Is that the one with the little roundhouse on top? It's the little roundhouse. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So I heard quaint. that there was a good raid, we, but we have not been there. Let's let's go. I can't believe it. We always go by. Oh. Oh. Boy, they are taking so long to... Ca- okay. Have we whipped the, the oarsmen yet recently? I uh, think I feel like we, we need to whip We're taking a day off from the whipping, but uh, you know what? We can make it a whipping day. Yeah, I think it, every day is a whipping day. Oh, we're getting close. Okay, we see the headland. Uh, the, oh, it is looks like it? he's going to be easy because That's there is it. only one little defender. That's it. One man, a broadsword. I think I see something glittering he's on not, his chest. A little golden cross. Not too tall either. A oh, little man. Look at him. He's wearing a skirt. I don't wear anything. Something on his back like some kind of a big puppet. <laughs> no no explanation. No idea why. No, no. It's supposed to frighten us. That does not, not frighten it's us. hilarious. 
We we could I I take a bet with you. Okay. Who is going to kill him first? Oh, I'm going straight for his genitals. I will. I'm going chop to kill him, him first. No, I'm going to kill okay. him because I will. I will jump. <laughs> That's it. That's what will take him out. That's it. All right, let's get ready. All right, let's. Get, we're getting close. It's going to be so fun. His secret. His mouth is moving. What does he say? Oh. Talk tall to me as a proud member of the Fatless Bones Audio Network! Hoss, <gasps> he. Gunthild, he speaks the ancient curse! Secret? I do not feel like reading anymore today. I feel like I'm doing the thing that we made fun of the Toriodon men for doing. The, I, I do not have a stain on my sail, but there is a stain elsewhere. But we go, we go away. Let's, we go let's, away. Let's, uh, turn around, everybody, oh, turn around. Heave, oh, heave, oh. No, just the boys on the right. Just the boys on the right. Oh my oh, god. Oh, full circle. I'm going to be sick. 